hello and welcome to Diecast Restos. I'm Jason and this is Majorette's number 202 Triumph TR7. It was made between 1982 and 1987. It featured these horrible chunky wheels from 1984 onwards. Thankfully, I'll be losing them for today's custom. I think aside from these, this makes for an excellent basis as beneath the chipped paintwork is a detailed casting. Here's how it should look in near perfect condition, ignoring the horrible wheels. And this is the car it was based on, the Triumph TR7. Triumph were formed in 1885 when Siegfried Bettmann began importing bicycles to the UK from Europe. The following year, the company began trading as Triumph and were manufacturing their own bicycles in Coventry, England by 1889. By 1902, Triumph began manufacturing motorcycles and by 1918 were the largest manufacturer of motorcycles in Britain. In 1921, Triumph acquired the Coventry-based Dawson Car Company and started producing the 1.4-litre Triumph 1020. Following the 1929 Great Depression, Bettmann's German subsidiary was sold off, then its bicycle manufacturing facility was also sold to Raleigh in 1932. In 1930, the company had been renamed the Triumph Motor Company. Realising the small company couldn't compete with larger rivals, Triumph focused on expensive luxury cars. By 1936, the motorcycle and motor car divisions were separated. Triumph Motorcycles was acquired by Jack Sangster, owner of rival motorcycle company Ariel. The motor car company went into a receivership in 1939 and its factories were destroyed by German bombing in 1940. Following the war, Standard Motor Company purchased Triumph's assets and a new range of Triumphs were announced in 1946. While the standard name was applied to the company's road cars, sports cars were adorned with the Triumph badge. The TR2 was unveiled in 1953, a 2-litre roadster to replace the Triumph Roadster. The TR1 had been a 1952 one-off prototype, hence the jump in nomenclature. The TR3 was a 1955 evolution of the model, which remained in production until 1962. In 1960, Standard Triumph was bought up by Leyland Motors. Then in 1961, the Giovanni Michelotti designed TR4 was unveiled. This used the chassis and drivetrain of the previous TR cars. The cars had suffered with a harsh ride quality, and so in 1965, the TR4A appeared, which had independent rear suspension. The 1967-68 TR5 was again visually similar to its predecessors, but had an improved 2.5-litre straight-six on the former standard 2.1-litre inline-4. In the US, the TR5 was sold as the TR250. It had twin carburettors fitted instead of the fuel injection system of the new engine. This produced 39 brake horsepower less than its counterpart. So this is the green I'll try to replicate on my TR7. This Tamiya TS22 coated with pearl clear should produce a similar effect. Following the TR5 was the TR6 in 1968. I've got a special project lined up regarding the TR6, so I'll gloss over it for now. By the time production ended in 1976, it was the best-selling TR car. The TR7 commenced production in 1974 and launched in the US in January 1975. It didn't make its UK debut until May 1976, with its launch delayed at least twice due to high demand in the States. Its distinctive wedge shape was designed by British Leyland chief designer Harris Mann. Mann had previously been responsible for BL's Austin Allegro and Princess. Both cars had been bastardised by British Leyland management, intent on cost-cutting, and so the final cars bore little resemblance to his original designs. The TR7, though, was almost identical to Mann's early concepts. It was powered by Triumph's 2.0-litre Slant 4 engine. After 1977, it had a red or green tartan check interior with matching door cards, while wheel trims were upgraded to a style not dissimilar to these. Other changes included the replacement of the nose-mounted badge to a larger Triumph laurel wreath emblem. A V8 version of the TR7 was developed and found its way into production by the cash-strapped BL in 1978. 
Instead of the weighty Triumph V8 as used in the Stag, it employed the use of BL stablemate Rover's famous V8. It was called the TR8 and following the 1979 Michelotti designed convertible TR7, nearly all TR8s thereafter were sold as convertibles. Here I'm sizing up my own recreation of the Triumph Wreath, which once printed onto decal paper can be affixed to my custom. A total of 115,000 TR7s were built, including 28,864 convertibles and there were 2,800 TR8s made. The TR7 was given a vote of confidence by the BL board in 1980 when they killed off the MGB due to the perception it was cannibalising TR7 sales. Just a quick word here about the pen I'm using. It's a replacement to the Sharpie that I'd usually use for this job as suggested by a viewer in the comments. This is a 0.7mm Artistro paint pen and it's a huge improvement. I've used the same sized Uniposca paint pens for some time, but the black has a matte finish. As you can see here, this Artistro pen has a suitably glossy sheen. But anyway, back to the TR7. The rationalisation of BL's lineup failed to improve the sales of the car, and so in 1981 it was discontinued. It marked the end of sports car production for the Triumph Mark. The brand continued until 1984 with the Triumph Acclaim its only offering. This was essentially a Honda Ballad, or Honda Civic Sedan as it would have been called in the US, that was made under licence in the UK. Since 1982, BL's car division had been renamed the Austin Rover Group, and the Morris Mark disappeared alongside Triumph in 1984. The Triumph trademark is now owned by BMW after they retained it following their 1994 purchase of the Rover Group. But now let's turn our attention away from the long and confusing history of British Leyland and its associated defunct brands. I didn't particularly like the garish yellow interior piece, so I painted it black and then needed to sort the rear light clusters. I coated them in chrome pen and I continue to use my Sharpie over this. I still prefer the transparent effect these have on top of the chrome. I also thought the Artistro Red was a bit too vibrant for the side reflectors, but hopefully some of this Citadel gloss will help tone it down. Like I said earlier, this casting lends itself to this kind of detailing. It's well designed and has lots of creases and grills into which the oil can flow. The previous brightly coloured tampos over red detracted from the detail. The casting did come in a plain red between 1982 and 1983, and with some fairly normal looking wheels too. It's a shame that it was such a short run, as the Tampo and fat wheel adorned castings are most prevalent I've found. I'm onto my finishing touches now, as the black plastic bumpers are brushed with Citadel, which acts as a back to black polish you might have used on your real car plastics. And so onto reassembly. I've polished and detailed the window piece with windshield wipers and a rear view mirror. The black interior piece goes in after this and then the wheels stand on top of the supports, no suspension on this model. Lastly, the plastic base is fitted, pushed down and then secured with an M2 screw. Now this is what my Majorette Triumph TR7 started off looking like. It was a really grubby example, a little bit dirt covered, fairly significantly scratched and with the chunky tyres fitted, it didn't have much going for it. It was a toss up between this and a Corgi Junior's TR7. This is a much better recreation, improved with opening doors and will be even better with some custom wheels fitted to it. So this is how it now looks. It's really vibrant in its new coat of green. I love the oversized Triumph Laurel as seen on some of the real TR7s. The wheels are as close as I could get to the late 70s revision style, but I really think these suit. That said, anything is an improvement over what it came with. The casting lines lend themselves nicely to some Citadel gloss to highlight the grooves. I'm also really pleased with the black Sharpie substitution to the Artistro paint pens. I can highly recommend them after using them on the body of this casting. So let me know your thoughts on this custom restoration in the comments. If you haven't yet, please consider subscribing. Over half of my viewers haven't, 
One quick click helps support the channel immensely. Thanks to those who already have, and in particular my supporters on Patreon. Links to join them are at the end of the video, but all that leaves me to say is thanks for watching, and I'll see you again for the next one. Bye for now. Thank you.